Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show. Now, I found a very interesting article on Zero Hedge today, and normally I don't go over long articles, but this was a very interesting one, so I plan on going over it. And I'm going to give my own opinions on a lot of things regarding this article. So, today is Wednesday, the 17th of August, 2022. Thank you for tuning in to Financial Turmoil Explained, and let's get started. Let's open up the charts right here and take a look at this article. It says, we are not the first civilization to collapse, but we'll probably be the last. It says, I'm standing on top of a 100-foot high temple mound, the largest known earthwork in the Americas, built by prehistoric peoples. The temperature is in the high 80s, along with the oppressive humidity. Have, I have emptied the park of all but a handful of visitors uh, because of the high humidity. And he says, my shirt is matted with sweat. I look out from the structures known as the Monk's Mound at the flatlands below, with smaller mounds dotting in the distance. These earthen mounds, built as, as a confluence of the Illinois, Mississippi, and Missouri rivers, are all that remain of one of the largest pre-Columbian settlements in nor north of Mexico, occupied from around 800, BC, 800 AD, I should say, to 1400 AD, by perhaps as many as 20,000 people. This great city, perhaps the greatest in North America, rose and flourished and fell into decline and was ultimately abandoned. It says, he says, civilizations die in familiar patterns. So, you know, this, I have to, can't not help but compare what's happening right now to the fall and decline of the Roman Empire. But the fall and decline of the Roman Empire is not the only rise and decline, you know. Uh, the Mesoamerican culture over here in South America and stuff, they had rises and declines. I think it was the Mayas, if I remember right. Uh, places in like Peru, they had, uh, and sometimes it's the weather that can cause these things to happen. Sometimes they become too reliant on something, maybe like corn or potatoes, a civilization. Uh, Mon money, a number of different things can cause this. But anyway, it says this great city, perhaps, oh, I already read that. Collapse occurs and can only occur in a power vacuum. Uh, collapse is possible where there are no competitors strong enough to fill the political vacuum of disintegration. Several centuries ago, the rulers of this vast city complex, which covered some 4,000 acres, including a 40-acre central plaza, stood where I stood. No doubt they saw below the teeming settlements of unassailable power with at least 120 temple mounds used as residences, sacred ceremonial sites, tombs, meeting centers, and ball courts. Chicoa warriors dominated the vast territory in which they extracted tribute to enrich the ruling class of this highly stratified society. Reading the heavens, these mound builders constructed several circle, circular astronomical observatories, wooden versions of Stonehenge. The city's hereditary rulers were venerated in life and death. A half a mile from the monk's mound is the seven-foot-high mound, which archaeologists found the remains of a man on a platform covered with 20,000 conch shells, disc beads from the Gulf of Mexico. The beads were arranged in the shape of a falcon, with the falcon's head beneath and besides the man's head. Its wings and tails were placed underneath the arms and legs. Below this layer of shells was the body of another man, buried face downward. Around these two men were six more human remains, possibly retainers. So possibly what they're talking about here is a burial of a king, or the very burial of a very important person. Uh... Yes, this was often the case, you know. It says, these men, these retainers, who may have been put to death to accompany the entombed man to, into the afterlife. Nearby were buried the remains of 53 girls and women ranging from the age of 15 to 30, laid out in rows of two layers separated by matting. They appeared to have been, well, 
yeah, th this is a practice from ancient times. Oftentimes they would want people who lived in close proximity to a very great man or a king or whatever to go into the afterlife at the same time, you know. Uh, okay, so it says here, uh, across the Mississippi River from Monk's Mound is a city is the city skyline of St. Louis. It is hard not to see our own collapse in that of Chakota. In 1950, St. Louis was the eighth largest city in the United States with a population of 856,000. Today, that number has fallen to below 300,000, a drop of some 65%. Major employers, Anheuser-Busch, McDonnell Douglas, TWA, Southwestern Bell, Ralston Purina Company, have dramatically re reduced their presence or left altogether. St. Louis is consistently ranked one of the most dangerous cities in the country. One in five people live in poverty. The St. Louis Metropol Metropolis Police Department has the highest rate of police killings per capita, uh, and it's the hundredth largest, one of the hundredth largest police departments in the nation, according to a 2021 report. It describes the jails here as being squalid, or horrible. 47 people died in custody between 2009 and 2019, complaining of water being shut off from their cells for hours. The guards routinely pepper spraying inmates uh, and also inmates on suicide watch. The city's crumbling infrastructure, hundreds of gut gutted and abandoned buildings, empty factories, vacant warehouses, and impoverished neighborhoods replicate the ruins of other post-industrial American cities, the classic signposts of a civilization in terminal decline. Yeah, th this is what's happening. And so on one of my other shows, if you guys haven't tuned into the Delta Report, uh, not the last show I produced, but the one before that, I talked about looking into the future to the year 2050 or 2060. And what I think it'll be like. And with this declining civilization that we have here. Uh, we've reached the peak of what this world. As far as industry. See, we had an industrial revolution. And we've re basically reached the peak of, of what we can do. In raping the earth of its resources. Natural resources. And once you hit that point, I mean, we're not on an infinite planet. It's finite. And we've already taken an awful lot of resources from this planet or polluted other resources. And our civilization has grown immensely during these years when we are expanding the monetary supply. Uh, the way the monetary supply is set up, like a Ponzi scheme, it has enhanced this process. It has enabled them to borrow money into the future in order to spread industry around the world, in order to, in order to harvest uh, uh, all the wood and build all the roads out. To see the effect of this, you only have to actually look at your roads in your community, you know. Uh, if you went back to the 1960s, uh, probably a lot of the roads weren't paved yet. Now your road you have is probably paved, but it wasn't paved this year. It's probably got cracks in it. Maybe grass is growing up between the cracks, you know, in places. Might be potholes, places where your road's starting to fall apart. That's because they've paved so many roads and went so far and it branched out so much while we were going through this phase of growth but you can't have in, infinite growth on a finite planet. And thus, what's happening is, is everything's starting to shrink back now at this point. It says, just as in the past, countries that are environmentally stressed, overpopulated, or both become at risk of getting politically stressed and their government's collapsing. Uh, when people are desperate, undernourished and without hope, they blame their governments, which they see as responsible 
for or unable to solve the problems. Boy, we're coming to that point right now, guys. Really fast, we're heading toward that point. And the food shortages we got coming are, are going to really help it increase this problem exponentially, make it a lot worse of people that are going to be desperate, unnourished, and without hope. And it says they blame their governments. And at a certain point when they get hungry enough, they not only blame their governments, but they are very, 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 very angry at that point. You have to understand that the governments are something that were made by the people. They're supposed to be for the people. But the government sometimes gets a little bit too big for its britches. I'm going to tell you what. They'll find out in the end who's really where the real power lies. The real power lies with the people, but the people have the people have to come to a certain point to cohese to a certain point. And what will bring about this cohesion for the people is when they start starving. And that's what they list here. It says when people are desperate, undernourished, and without hope. So, I mean, if people are not undernourished, they do have hope. People are, are, are always look to the slightest thing that they can as hope. And desperate, the desperation comes because they're undernourished. So this is a big one. These three they talk about here, when people are desperate, undernourished, and without hope, undernourished is the biggest one that points right out and says, hey, this is what's causing all this. It is the fact that there's not enough food to go around. That's where we're headed. Pre-industrial civilizations were dependent on the limits of solar energy and constraints of roads and waterways. Uh, impediments that were obliterated when fossil fuel became an energy source. As industrial empires became global, their increase in size meant an increase in complexity. Ironically, this complexity makes us more vulnerable to catastrophic collapse. I love it that they put that in there about the complexity and interdependency within this system, especially to the Internet and to the power grid. It makes the system more vulnerable to catastrophic collapse. Not just collapse, he says catastrophic collapse. Soaring temperatures. It says Iraq has got 120 degree heat, has fried the country's electrical grid, the depletion of natural resources, floods, droughts. The worst drought in 500 years devastating Western Central Europe. Uh, Decline in crop yields of about 8 or 9%. Well, personally, I think it's worse than that. Power outages, wars, pandemics, a rise in, in, in zoonotic diseases. Well, that's putting it mildly. I think that we have a rise in these bioweapons facilities that work with strange and unusual viruses. And they have now something that they, is called gain of function. And it's just exactly what it sounds like. Gain meaning make it better of function. When something functions, they make it function better. So, you know, I mean, if you're going to do gain of function on your car, you go out and pull the engine out and put a bigger engine in, a stronger engine. So if you're going to do gain of function to a virus... You're going to make the virus so that it doesn't just pass between animal to animal. It passes from animal to human and then from human to human, uh, of course. And you're also going to make it so that it attacks humans in a much worse way. And they're out there, these laboratories, doing the best they can to make viruses that will destroy humanity. And, and I mean, what can I say? So he lists zoonotic diseases and a breakdown of supply chains, combine and a shaking of the foundations of industrial society. It says the Arctic has been heating up four times faster than the global average, resulting in an, a, an accelerated melting of the Greenland ice sheet. Freakish weather patterns. Freakish weather patterns. I mean, this is absolutely true. These storms, I cannot describe them, and it's anything else but freakish. 
The Barents Sea north of Norway and Russia are warming up seven times faster. Climate scientists did not expect this extreme weather until 2050. Uh, it, it talks here about civilization is an experiment in a very recent way of life in the human career. It has a habit of walking into what I call progress traps. A small village of good land beside a river is a good idea, but when the village grows into a city and paves over the good land, it becomes a bad idea. While prevention might have been easy, a cure may be impossible. The city isn't easily moved. This human inability to foresee or watch out for long-range consequences may be inherent to our kind. Shaped by the millions of years when we lived from hand to mouth by hunting and gathering. Now, see, I don't really believe that we were here for millions and millions of years, but that's besides the point. Uh... It says that it also may also be a little more than a mix of inertia, uh, greed, and foolishness encouraged by the shape of, so, of a social pyramid, the concentration of power at the top of large-scale societies give the elite a vested interest in the status quo. They continue to prosper in darkened times long after the environment and general populace begin to suffer. Well, boy, that last statement is really true there about the elite and how they have a vested interest in the status quo and how that this world is run in a pyramid style with the with the po power being concentrated at the top and then filtering down through the masses <clears throat> he says the archaeologists who dig us up will need to wear hazmat suits Humankind will leave a telltale layer within the fossil record composed of everything we produce from mounds of chicken bones to wet wipes to tires to mattresses and other household waste to metals, concrete, plastic, and industrial chemicals and the nuclear residue of power plants and weaponry. We have cheated our children, handing them tawdry luxuries and addictive gadgets while we take away what is left of the wealth. Uh, the wonder and the possibility of a pristine earth. Boy, he said a mouthful there. With the borrowing into the future. Children are going to have nothing. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely sick what they're doing to the youth. You know, the baby boomer generation. Uh, what they did to the, uh, uh, to the world out there, especially the rich ones amongst the baby boomers. We've had a 40-year debt binge. And with anything, there always comes an end to, to, to this debt binge. But, you know, at the same time, what we've seen is, and I've said this before, we've seen the world spread out and basically harvesting of the world. But it reached a, a, a height, kind of like peak oil, you know, Peak this, peak that, peak everything else. And then it goes into decline because you can't increase it past that point. So everything is now in, de in decline. But, uh, you know, the world population hasn't went into decline yet. Uh, it's a protracted curve, you know. It's, it's not, we're not there yet to the point, but it's going to be a sudden decline because everything else... The monetary system, too, hasn't went into decline. They've increased the monetary supply artificially, simulating increased growth. No place else is a better example of this than China, with their ghost cities. Seemingly increasing their industry and everything else. I mean, it takes a lot of concrete, takes a lot of materials like copper, and et cetera, et cetera. This affects the entire world when they build cities the size of Chicago with no people in them. Well, they've pretty much carried that to their limit now. With Evergrande going down, you know, that was a, that was a bursting of that bubble and the, and the conclusion of that, that monumental growth. So China's starting to 
reaches peak, this peak China. Let's call that peak China. You know, the United States is well past their peak. Plus, because this is an oil based society, we're past peak oil now. In fact, one of the things that supported the oil industry was the fact that they went into shale oil. But shale oil doesn't have any staying power. It follows something they call the Red Queen, where you're still running as fast as you can, you can't get ahead. And that sure does sound like an awful lot of people out there with their jobs and stuff now. You know, you have to keep getting more and more jobs just to keep up with where you used to be with one job. Now you got four jobs. You can only work so hard. I'm running as fast as I can. My legs are just going like a burr, you know. And what's happening is, is you're not making as much as you used to make just a few years ago. You used to have savings. And now it's just dwindling. Everything's Everybody is being squeezed this way because this is a declining civilization. It's going to keep squeezing. It's going to keep squeezing tighter and tighter and tighter, especially the middle class, you know, until you've got, I mean, all these new IRS agents are going to have to be paid and they're going to have to be out there with, well, I guess they're armed and they're going to be wanting the, 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 the money. They want the money. Show me the money. But you say, well, I haven't got the money. I haven't got the money. I've just got enough for my to pay my rent. Well, now you're not going to pay your rent anymore. You're going to pay it to them. Now you only got enough for food. You're going to be sitting on the corner. But you know, they told you this years ago. They, uh, they said that um, the uh, central bank comes to the United States of America. That in the end, uh, your, your, your grandchildren will be sitting on the porch. Basically, they're sitting, on the, sitting out on the curb of the road with no food to eat. On the very continent where their forefathers came or something to that effect, you know, I mean, I could look it up, but, but it's basically telling you what would be the end result. And it couldn't be possibly be truer, you know? And so what happens ultimately in the end is we do get this declining civilization, but something's going to spring up in its place because it takes an awful lot to make sure that every single person on earth doesn't make it uh you know so let's take a look a little bit so he talked about chacoa this civilization in north america that d declined and he says that violence increased dramatically uh it says surrounding towns were burned to the ground groups numbering in the hundreds were slaughtered and buried in mass graves at the end the enemy killed all the people indiscriminately the intent was not merely prestige, but an early form of ethnic cleansing, writes anth or anthropologist Timothy R. Uh, Pukadat, Pukadat, or something like that. This is name. Anyway, the ancient Chacoa and the Mississippians. I guess that come from that book. And this same thing happened in Easter Island, you know, where they slaughter one another in the end. Uh, the the people rally uh, everything. It comes down to a, a a massive. The decline goes along slowly for a long time until it reaches the point where the people just can't feed themselves any longer, and then mass hysteria breaks out. But there's a conclusion to that, as well. And then something new comes. But he's noting here in this article this time. Now, he talked about all these other collapses, but they were generally in a smaller area and they were able to move to a fresh area or they were able to get a fresh start or whatever. He says this time the collapse will be global. It will be not be possible, as in ancient societies, to migrate to new ecosystems that are rich in natural resources. The steady rise in heat will devastate crop yields and make much of the planet uninhabitable. Climate scientists warn that once temperatures rise by 4 degrees Celsius, the Earth at best will be able to sustain only a billion people. Uh, the more insurmountable the crisis becomes, the more we, like our prehistoric ancestors, will retreat into self-defeating responses, violence, magical thinking, and denial. 
He says the difference is in the scale. This time there will be no exit. It's because we've grown to a certain point, you know, and I look at this picture here with this skeleton holding up the cell phone. This is one of the big enemies of our civilization is the cell phone, you know, because it robs our minds blind. I've always hated the cell phones. Never did like them. One thing, they put out radiation, but we've grown used to that. Of course, we haven't grown used to the consequences, cancers and everything. People that use them a lot. Uh, and the, the, like I say, it absorbs your mind. You just take a look at some kid, you know, he'd be sitting in the doctor's office or at home or sitting on the couch or whatever. He's not doing anything. His mind is sitting there right into that cell phone, whatever it is, whether it's TikTok or some new video game or whatever. It's a very, very, uh, they used to talk about the television that way and say the TV was bad for that. But cell phones are much, much worse. And every blinking person has them now. We've moved so fast into this too because just go back 20 or 30 years ago and it wasn't this way. In fact, there wasn't anything, but there wasn't any smartphones now out there back then. Now everybody has one of the blinking things. I'm very concerned about the demise of, of, of our society. I can see it accelerating. Remember, I used to listen to uh, to uh, the Golden Jim, Jim, the Golden Jackass, you know, on uh, YouTube here. I used to listen to his talks. I used to really enjoy listening to his talks. Uh, and uh, he used to talk about it. He used to call it the quickening. I haven't heard him. I haven't heard his talks for a while now. And... Uh, I haven't heard about that. You know, if you guys know anything about that, go in the comment section and tell me. Uh, but I do can tell you that he was right. Is This is some sort of a quickening. And I think he was also right about something else. He said the dollar is going to go up and up and up and up and up, and then it's going to die. Remember him saying that. I think he's right about that too. And it appears like, some of the things he said is, is actually coming true right now. And we're watching it in real time, including this demise of the, of the world economy. Because the dollar being the de facto world reserve currency, its demise is going to lead to the demise of the whole Western civilization. And the Eastern civilization, they're over there and they're cheering it on. But at the same time, uh, it's not... What they're doing, the things that they're doing are, are right now is, is hard on them, you know. But it could be devastating to the West. We're going to have to see what happens with all of this. And I don't think we got a long time to wait. I think that we're well deep into this these insurmountable problems that are building up. And how it all pans out for you, your families. Well, stay tuned, guys, because I'm trying my best to stay on top of this thing as it progresses. Thank you guys for listening to my show. I know it's a little bit of a long one, but we'll catch you guys in the next episode. Bye-bye.